So thank you all for joining us today for today's event. My name is Naila Glez and uh, I am the president of Eurocadre, the European Trade Union for Professionals and Managers. As a recognized uh, social partner and representative of the fastest growing category of workers in Europe, we are delighted to have the chance to meet and work with all of you today, hoping, hopefully, to push for further action in this crucial area. We are co-hosting today's event with CEPLIS, and I would like to thank you both CEPLIS and ESC uh, for ensuring that today uh, became possible. Our aim over both our sessions today is to evaluate our progress in the field of gender equality, an area where trade unions have for a long time supported the excellent work of many of our panelists today. Normally this time of the year is an opportunity for the European Commission to propose new initiatives on International Women's Day, which give us plenty of reading to do along with cautious cause of, for optimism. However, this year we wanted to mark this period with some honest reflection and appraisal. Where have we actually moved ahead? Have we made any changes inclusive? And how can we continue to progress over the course of this year? Throughout European workplaces, the need for further action to deliver gender parity has been self-evident for decades. With inequality in pay, conditions, the care burden, and many other areas, the ability for women to fully participate in working life has not been reached. Technical solutions offered post-pandemic have failed to eradicate the root causes of inequality, and this is where trade unions, civil society, and legislators must step in. We've had quite a lot of activity this year and have a lot to get through today, so before we get into our panels, I'd like to pass to Mr. Gaetano Stella, President of CEPLIS, please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, on behalf of the European Council of Liberal Professions, I would like to warmly welcome you to this conference jointly organized with our partners, Eurocadre. The subject we are going to debate on, with the help of excellent panelists, who I'd like to thank for accepting to bring their expertise in today's discussions, is how successful we have been up to now in delivering gender equality. Not many years ago, some of us here are old enough to remember women, that's go to say, that is to say, the gender of more than half of our active, active population were still prevented from studying and were legally excluded from the exercise of several professions in most of the states of the current European Union and of the world in general. A lot of progress was thankfully achieved during the last decades, but there is still a whole lot that needs to be done. Girls are still discouraged from pursuing certain disciplines traditionally viewed as leading to professions more suitable to men. <coughs> the old but always timely principle of equal payment for equal work has not yet become a fact in a big number of professional occupations. Decision-making positions are still very largely occupied by men, including the cost in the context of professions where women are the majority of the members. Issues regarding maternity leave and gender balance regarding parental leaves are still a long way from being equitably settled. Gender-based violence and to work is still a painful issue and not enough is done for the moment to address it from lawmakers and managers. The disproportionate care gap is penalizing women who wish to pursue challenging careers. As a collective voice of the European professions of law, health care, compass and number, we have tried to raise awareness on these important issues 
and those our politicians are accountable for the realization of their promises. Today's conference gives us an excellent and long-awaited opportunity to discuss how many of the plans to build a more gender equal Europe announced with solemnity and sometimes pomp were translated into facts. An opportunity to change, exchange good practice and to reach conclusions lightening the way forward. You are all together in this. A successful European Union is one who can fully benefit from the potential of all its citizens, women and men. Equality is not just a moral but also an economic necessity. Have a very fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Stella. And now, I think, since we are a bit late on our agenda, we have to uh, move further. We welcome uh, Maria Nicolopoulou from the ESC. Um, she is the rapporteur for the opinion on gender lens investing as a way to improve gender equality in the EU. I think Maria is online. So the floor is yours, Maria. of the organization of Women's Inc. from the Netherlands. Uh, so the concept is that the, the financial aspect of gender equality remains uh, a, a sort of a blind spot in the, in the EU policies. Uh, and only by creating an inclusive financial ecosystem in the EU and in the member states, we can really advance faster uh, towards gender equality. So now we are at a sort of a turning point as uh, gender budgeting and gender lens investing uh, gain momentum, but it's still very fragmented across uh, across the European Union, and we we lack a little bit of uh, of a systemic focus. So, what did we want to reflect on the opinion? The fact that without specific funding for female entrepreneurship and for self-employment, but also funding for specific gender policies. To, to keep women in the labor market and other measures that will improve women's position, the evolution towards an egalitarian society will be much, much slower. So we, we analyze the situation in, in, let's say, in three levels. On a micro level, uh, it's about creating a, a fertile ground for female entrepreneurship. Uh, we need to fill the pipeline with women uh, with entrepreneurial spirit, but of course this is not something that it will happen from one day to another, neither uh, magically. So we need to take concrete actions on that. Um, on a meso level, it's about uh, making the financial system more inclusive and creating a, a ecosystems that will grant the equal access to finance to women and men to boost their projects. And it's, it's not about fixing women in the sense, it's about fixing the actual system. And on a macro level, uh, it's about gender budgeting and public funding. Um, how how do, we, do we spend uh, uh, the public money? You know, for which specific purposes? So just, just to give you a, a few numbers to set a little bit the scene, on a European level, uh, on a venture capital investments, all male funded teams receive 92% of, of the money invested in Europe and only 1% goes to female-led companies. And we have similar numbers as well when it comes to, to public procurement. So what, what do we propose uh, in the opinion to, to move forward? First of all, to make sure that women are able to push the buttons. How? 
having having more women in senior management positions and in partner roles. Uh, we do have now the Women on Board Directive, uh, which for bigger companies it will help towards this direction, but we need to think about the SMEs as well. And then we also need to make sure that uh, we do not reject uh, women from funding due to unconscious bias or outdated criteria. For example, uh, the juries that they decide on how to distribute the funds, uh, we think they, they need to, to get an unconscious bias training so that they do not consider men by default as more suitable uh, people to invest, uh, only to invest on their projects. And of course, uh, once again, very, very important to, to make these precise uh, juries uh, uh, balanced, gender balanced. Equal attracts equal uh, in this sense. Now, as, uh, as, as per the criteria, if, for example, experience is a criteria to get funds, why not make diversity as well a criteria? Diverse teams, they're not a problem to solve, they're actually the solution to a problem. Involving more women means better return on investment, better decision making, um, better culture in, within the companies and, and don't forget as well the trickle down effect that companies with female founders for example and executives uh, they tend to hire more women and they reach up to six six times more uh, more women are hired by other women so another point that we wanted to highlight is that uh, to make sure that uh, women start their own business in the first place and uh, and for this, we really, really, really need to, to start very early. We need to work on education, to challenge the stereotypes, uh, the gender stereotypes, but we also need to work on specific training programs uh, with for hard skills and for soft skills as well. And in this sense, uh, schools will play uh, a very important role in developing uh, financial and entrepreneurial skills programs. Um, and and also building on, on women's confidence. So make sure we do not uh, develop the imposter syndrome, which is uh, very much a large scale, exists among women. No? We think we're not good enough uh, for what we're doing. So if we also increase on a European level programs, uh, uh, working with role models, networking, mentoring, all, all these elements, uh, will help bring more more women into into the business world. Um, now, another important element to, to have in mind is data collection. Uh, we need data to be able to to propose adequate solutions uh, for for future measures. So, we we do have some some data on gender budgeting and on gender lens investing, but first of all, we need more data and we need the member states uh, to have it as a mandatory criteria to, to deliver more data from the private and the public sector so that we can create a holistic overview of uh, what's going on on the ground and to be able to monitor and to be able to evaluate better the situation. And of course, we need to think on developing uh, gender dedicated funds to make sure that investments reach the women uh, in, in their different volumes, so small companies, but also medium and and, and larger uh, projects. So beyond uh, thinking about direct direct financing, we also highlighted in the opinion the the, the potential of budgeting uh, with with a gender perspective on on a, on a member state level, on the regional budgets, but on the general budgets as well, and on the on an EU level. And we wanted to reflect on the use of gender budgeting tools all through the budgetary cycle to ensure that, that, that all the necessary policies are financed adequately so that they can create, the, um, uh, first of all, the conditions to mobilize uh, the resources from the private sector, but also to take care of, of public policies as well. And the process of defining the budgets uh, in this specific point, the participation of civil society and social dialogue, we think it's it's paramount uh, to be able to detect the areas where we really need uh, to pay more attention. Um, 
And one tool that, that, is, that is quite useful for, for this purpose is the gender impact assessment uh, and a gender analysis uh, of, of the policies. Now, the problem is that a lot of people are working uh, with budgets. They don't really have the knowledge to put gender budgeting into practice. So uh, where to start? There is a lot of work done already by AGE, but the European Women's Lobby, there is a lot of material. So we need we recommend in the opinion training on budgetary on gender budgeting and gender mainstreaming to all people uh, working in the financial institutions but also in in the administration um, and I, I mentioned diversity earlier as a criteria for private funding but this is also uh, applicable in the public funding uh, on a European level or a national level um, we need to use public funds and public procurement precisely to promote uh, women talent. So the, the, this goes without saying that uh, it's important to also set a specific standards and criteria to avoid pinkwashing, which is also one of the risks uh, during the process. Um, and uh, we also want to, to invite people to, to bear in mind as well the obstacles that prevent women from creating their own projects. Uh, not only the gender stereotypes, we, I mean, previous speaker also mentioned uh, the, the insufficient work-life balance, uh, really, really lack of time in this sense, uh, the burden of unpaid caring activities as well in the house. Uh, and think about the current imbalances as well, as well in the labor market uh, that precisely lead to women having fewer opportunities for training in, in management and entrepreneurial skills, but also lower um, capacity to accumulate savings that require to, to really start a business. So to sum up, uh, in the opinion, we call for an ambitious vision on the European Union on gender lens investing and, and on gender budgeting, including concrete targets concrete KPIs, updated criteria for public funding, uh, and incentivize programs uh, on improving female entrepreneurship, and a plan to change into a, an inclusive financial uh, ecosystems in order to be able to accelerate the pace towards an effective uh, gender equality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria for this uh, very good introductory uh, words. Um, so, we have a, a packed agenda, so let's dive into our first panel <laughs> straight away. Uh, we will begin by examining what we have seen in the past 12 months and asking if this has been a year of transition or tangible change. Uh, Commission, van der Leyen, um, Commission President van der Leyen placed gender equality at the center of her mandate in 2019 with promises to reduce the existing pay and pension uh, gap between men and women while promoting women in STEM and leadership roles. From a European perspective, we have seen a lot of movement on new and existing file with, I'm happy to say, a number of long-standing trade union demands included in the latest developments. While there's a long way to go, any progress made in the stark is in stark contrast to generations of um, inactivity. But how much, if any, change has been really, truly delivered? So to discuss this, I'm delighted to be joined by some of the leading voices in the, in the fight for uh, gender equality in Europe. We have MEP uh, Evan Insir, who is joining us online from uh, Sweden, I think. Uh, we have also Dina Vardaramatu, Vardaramatu from the European Women's Lobby, welcome. Uh, from Eurocarers, we have uh, Stacey Igemonos, and we have also Susanna uh, Pisano from Con Confrofissioni. Thank you very much all for joining us today. So, um, without any delays, uh, MEP in here, I know that you have been uh, very patient online. Uh, you yourself has, um, have been kept quite busy this year, and we will discuss the combating violence directive later, 
but how do you assess the progress or the lack of progress over the last 12 months? Uh, I hope you can hear us. So the floor is yours. Hear you, and I hope you can also hear me here from uh, Stockholm. Do you see me? Also. Yes, we can hear you okay. very well, and we can see you as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I'm not able to be with you uh, physically, um, but but thank you for the invitation to this very uh, important event with a very very timely and important topic, a topic uh, and challenges uh, that and problems that have existed in our society for centuries, for decades, and year after year and day by day. Um, uh, that women and girls are challenged, are facing um, the, uh, the uh, and uh, yes, it is true that uh, it's been quite a lot uh, in, uh, going on in the European Parliament and the, in the European Union. But it is very important that it's a lot going on. For 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 so long, very little has happened on this matter of gender-based violence um, in in our 27 member states as well as the European Union as a whole. Um, right now, uh, I am, or um, during last year, I had the honor to be um, uh, elected as uh, the uh, co-rapporteur for EU's first ever um, directive on, uh, on combating violence against women uh, and domestic violence. And why I'm saying that it's historical, because it's, it's the first one of its kind, uh, but it is also historical because it is time to go from words to actions in combating this heinous violence that is taking place all across our union against women and girls. Um, we have, from the side of the European Parliament for years, uh, tr uh, demanded actions on the field. Um, we, uh, to 2021, in the uh, autumn of 2021, I was a part of... Uh, uh, also putting forward a report on uh, on um, making gender-based violence to an EU crime. Uh, and then in parallel to that report, there was also a report on uh, combating violence against women and girls um, on, um, uh, on uh, cyber violence. And these two reports, I think, for 20, uh, during 2021 were very important to pave the way for the directive that the Commission presented 8th of March last year. And we were, of course, very, uh, we welcomed the, direct, uh, the directive uh, very warmly. Um, nevertheless, there are good things to be found in the directive. Um, it is focused on combating rape, eliminating rape. It is also focusing on FGM. Uh, as well as combating cyber violence. However, um, as, um, as one of the two rapporteurs and together with my co-rapporteur, uh, Francis Fitzgerald, we saw also that the um, uh, directive could improve further. So we uh, strengthened the rape paragraph, the consent paragraph to be more specific. Um, and we also um, added um, uh, sterilization as one new area to be criminalized, as well as, as well as, um, uh, uh, also added uh, prohibition of um, of uh, buying services from uh, p women uh, and the girls in prostitutions, um, and also um, uh, pimping. So we had broadened the the uh, the directive further because we see that there are many challenges. One of the that are and many crimes that are taking place place uh, against women and girls and there are many challenges in the European Union and some of them are European competent uh, European Union competence others are national competence and of course the directive we are trying to ensure that it is is touching up on the EU competence because we do not want this directive to get stuck uh, in the Council or anywhere else. We need to, from the side of the European Union, forcefully combat this violence that are taking place against women and girls, uh, and therefore we need to ensure that we also have a directive in place as soon as possible to start our work. But with this said, the, uh, the 27 member states have also a huge responsibility to combat uh, this heinous violence that is taking place. Um, so yes, we have. I have myself, together with my co-rapporteur Francis Fitzgerald, been very occupied. But we are occupied um, gladly because this uh, being occupied means also uh, ensuring that we can see change in place 
soon in our union. We know, for example, that all across Europe, at least 50 women uh, per week are killed as a consequence of domestic violence, only when the domestic violence. And then we can imagine the figures when it comes to uh, gender-based violence uh, at large. Um, and, uh, and a huge number of young women, for example, are being faced with and attacked with, uh, with uh, gender-based violence uh, on cyberspace. And many of the women in, for example, public sphere, uh, politicians, journalists within civil society are also being um, specifically um, uh, uh, being specifically targeted due to them being women and being in public positions. This is also something that me and my co-rapporteur um, uh, strengthened uh, within the directive to ensure to make um, uh, those kind of crimes and uh, aggravated circumstance. Another uh, aggravated circumstance that we added was also another um, uh, big problem that we have in our union and beyond, and that's um, that's uh, so-called honor crimes. Um, so, uh, and of course, we need to start with preventing because that's the biggest. Um, the most important thing to do to prevent this kind of violence to take take place. But if they take place, they cannot be uh, be faced with impunity. And they are the uh, the legislations that are in place and hopefully will be in place soon. Also, they need to be implemented. Uh, and when women and girls in those cases they are um, survivors of. Uh, of uh, gender-based violence, they need to be ensured to get all kind of support that they are in need of when it comes to healthcare, medical, as well as um, if uh, they would need um, uh, shelters. Uh, in some of our member states, 2023, women and girls are forced to pay their own for their own shelters, even though they are the one um, uh, facing these uh, crimes. So. As you hear, there are quite a lot to do before we see a true feminist and a gender equal European Union. Uh, and I am proud to be able to be a part of this uh, struggle that we uh, that we see are being intensified um, this uh, this last year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, MEP Insir. Uh, definitely, we go straight in the in the hot topic here and uh, from a trade union perspective we are very delighted that, to see that the parliament uh, amended text proposed a greater <coughs> emphasis on the workplace violence and harassment with enforceable actions aimed at uh, protecting workers um, so yeah it is a historic text i would say and uh, we should uh, rightly celebrate as even being proposed um, but now uh, Okay, I understand I'm uh, putting you under uh, pressure, Dina, uh, because being face to face with the rapporteur, but um, do you have any reaction of what we have just heard from MEP in here? Thank you for putting me on the spot straight away. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, okay, I will start by saying that last year we have seen many um, achievements. We have seen the blocking of the Women on Boards Directive. We have seen the introduction of the Pay Transparency um, Directive, the proposal. And, you know, we are very happy about the proposal. We have been fighting for it for a decades. And it's a document that can be uh, improved. Uh, we have um, um, contributing as the European Women's Lobby on the fight for a feminist Europe, and that means uh, that all forms of violence against women should be addressed. And this is something that we are lobbying for through this directive as well. Uh, we welcome the legal definition of rape. Uh, the recognition of female genital mutilation as a criminal offence and the prosecution of key forms of, of, line, of online violence, such as non-consensual sharing of intimate or manipulated material, cyber harassment and cyber stalking. We also support the harmonisation of penalties 
limitation periods for the prosecution and decision on the covert forms of violence, access to justice and support services to women and girls throughout the EU. However, the directive should be strengthened. The European Parliament and the EU Council must now ensure that all aspects of sexual exploitation of women, a euro crime recognized in the EU treaties, are covered, including sexual violence, sexual harassment, prostitution, surrogacy, and other forms of abuse over women's sexuality and reproductive health. The directive must criminalize all forms of sexual abuse. You will be hearing us saying that uh, again and again, uh, including sexual violence, rape and sexual harassment, abuse over women's sexuality, including female genital mutilation, forced abortion and sterilization, forced pregnancy, and sexual exploitation, including prostitution, pornography and surrogacy. We are seeing worrying discussion in the Council on the possible removal of Article 5 on rape. We are doing everything together with our members to ensure that this article will stay in the text and guarantee crucial harmonized legislation and therefore the protection of women and girls in the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dina. This is uh, quite clear. Uh, I, I heard that MEP in C will have to leave like in half an hour, so uh, we will try to uh, see her reaction. But before that, I will turn to you, Stacey. Uh, so we can see that uh, the pandemic highlighted the vulnerability of care staff in a way none of us could have expected. There are various references to care staff in the text, but does the, the directive go far enough in providing safeguards to these workers and how uh, more can be done in the text to provide safer working environments. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. I actually bring a pretty specific um, perspective on the, on the issue of gender equality because we represent informal carers at European level, that is people who provide usually unpaid long-term care to a person with disability, chronic disease or any other long-lasting care needs. Um, we are obviously in the context of uh, an aging Europe with growing, uh, a growing demand for care, a declining supply as well, and a lot of quality and sustainability challenges when it comes to the future of our care system. So at this stage, you may be wondering what's the link with gender equality. Well, the link is, um, is actually simple. Uh, a huge majority of the professional long-term care workforce uh, consists of women, more than, uh, than 80% of professional long-term carers are women. More than 60% of informal carers are also women. Uh, obviously, women provides the lion's, the lion's share, not only of informal long-term care, but also, of course, childcare in Europe. And, um, and I would even go uh, so far as to say women also uh, experience more long-term care needs as they grow older than men. So when we discuss care and caring in Europe, the gender dimension is at the very core of that discussion. And so our take on the topic is that we cannot address the future of care and caring in Europe without, without looking at gender equality first. Now, Coming back to your question about the impact of the pandemic, the positive impact has been that suddenly um, a majority uh, in, a, in continuing, a continuous number, growing number of policymakers have come to realize that we should pay attention to care systems in Europe and again to the role of women in the, con the, um, the provision of care. Um, and um, uh, to build on what was said by my predecessors, um, beyond the, 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 the proposals currently on the table, there are other instruments actually that were put forward in the last two, three years by the Commission where the gender dimension is also extremely um, prominent. I'm thinking, for example, of the recently launched EU care strategy, which, which is obviously uh, now our new Bible for the future of our activities. Uh, where gender is, is a central question uh, addressed. A few years ago, we also 
uh, spent some years lobbying uh, hard to make sure the, the perspective of informal carers would be captured, and it is captured in the Directive on Work-Life Balance for Parents and Carers. That's also on the table, and there again, the gender, the gender dimension is very strong. So there are now many instruments on the table then we, that we can use to, um, to, to push for a more gender-equal Europe. Um, the, the challenge we're seeing in the future is enforcement, implementation at national regional level. A lot of member states are still reluctant to uh, transpose these directives or you know, are watering down the, the, actually the, the principles of these instruments as they translate them. And um, we're still very much, you know, it's still very much work in progress. So to answer your question, uh, yes, it is a year of transition. But uh, we're hopeful, let's say. There, there are many, many tools in the toolbox now. So we hope to, uh, that you know, this will make a difference in, in, in the near future. Thank you very much, Stacy. And uh, now I go to Susanna. And Stacy mentioned that there may be pushback from member states as to the legal basis of, of this directive. So if you could send a message to the national politicians, Susanna, what this message could be? Lisa? Okay. Yes. Uh, so I think uh, uh, that uh, um, gender question, uh, violence, uh, uh, gender balance, uh, uh, income of a women, are a, a, a principal question in the future for um, a modern society. Uh, Europe in this, uh, in this time uh, with the strategy uh, focus the, uh, the cluster uh, uh, the matter uh, uh, to, to address and I think that uh, stat member state uh, had, has uh, to have to to adopt uh, law, European law, but improved and uh, uh, correct uh, implementing. Uh, the, um, the control of uh, uh, the European level uh, uh, on uh, the correct implementation of uh, European legislation uh, is uh, uh, slow very slow, uh, and the procedure of uh, infraction, uh, I don't uh, see the, the end of this process. So, uh, in, the, in the matter of violence, for example, uh, is a, a, a fact, uh, uh, a correct fact that uh, the violence is a human right uh, abuse, uh, a fight uh, uh, against the violence against the woman is a normal, correct uh, work of a lot of, uh, of people of a state name. I think that uh, the uh, insert the chart of the human rights and the European human rights in the treaty in Lisbon uh, concern that uh, it's possible to try the uh, juridical basis for all activity against the, uh, uh, the question, uh, the violence, uh, the harassment in the workplace, uh, 
is another uh, situation with the, the uh, convention of VILO uh, uh, under the 90. Uh, and uh, I think that the state member have uh, to, uh, to improve this action uh, and no uh, to uh, instrumental, uh, critical, the position uh, European. So, uh, Italian is uh, uh, always uh, in the low place uh, of uh, indicator of a gender equality index, but uh, uh, we have uh, in Italian uh, a strategy national. We, in uh, the 2021, uh, did uh, uh, and adopt a strategy national for gender equality uh, on the uh, uh, in conform uh, to the uh, European strategy, but but without violence, because uh, our legislation, uh, in order the uh, uh, fighting uh, to violence against the women, is uh, a lot is uh, dated uh, from uh, 20 years ago. And uh, now we are uh, uh, discussing in order a new crime uh, defined as feminicid. Uh, so uh, the um, uh, murder uh, the men against the women, woman uh, only for the fact that is a woman. Uh, uh, an abuse, uh, an uh, so, uh, suprafaction. Uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, field, we are um, a lot uh, uh, in advance. Uh, so, thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, okay, so... Uh, I would like to hear more uh, from MEP Nsir before she, she leaves us. Uh, and I have uh, two questions for you. Uh, one of them is that we have seen a move uh, in the combating violence uh, against women. We have seen a move to uh, punishing economic harm done to victims of violence or harassment at the workplace with this directive. And is this yet another example of how we must address gender-based on a holistic level, uh, taking into account not only the physical and mental impacts, but also the ability to work and participate in society? Uh, but I would also ask you if you have any answer to what Dina just uh, um, revealed a few minutes ago. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first, maybe I, I should start with, uh, with uh, the last question. And um, uh, it is, uh, I have also heard, unfortunately, that, uh, that uh, the council, some member states within the council, wants to water down the directive tremendously. Um, not at least when it comes to the rape or conscience, par uh, conscience paragraph. That would be, according to my point of view, a huge blow um, if uh, if uh, uh, the, the uh, rape paragraph was was taken out of the uh, um, of uh, the directive, because we know how big uh, of a um, problem this is within our 27 countries within the whole European Union, and I hope that the member states will come to understand that. Uh, if uh, if uh, to take out that paragraph would would undermine the whole struggle uh, that uh, that is needed on a European Union uh, level, uh, and I also can just under uh, yeah echo what what was said about that there are many other uh, grounds. Uh, to, to be added to the directive to ensure that it is a holistic directive. However, as co-rapporteur, both myself and my co-rapporteur, Francis Fitzgerald, we are very, uh, we, our ambition is to have a strong directive, um, uh, but at the same time, a directive that actually uh, will have a chance to pass. That's why we also decided where we should choose our ba what battles we should choose um, and that uh, we are very much aware that already those battles that we have uh, at this uh, step chosen will be uh, uh, will be a big one itself uh, 
However, we are right now in the state of where we are discussing and we will go into so-called shadow meetings together with representatives from the dif from all the different party political groups in uh, the parliament and from both our committees, the Committee of Civil, Civil Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs, where, where I am serving, and the Gender Equality Committee, where Frances uh, is, uh, is um, serving. Um, and then when it comes to uh, to um, uh, harassment at workplaces and when it comes to to um, uh, the labor market um, it's very much the gender based violence that is taking place place is very much also linked to the economic strength uh, of uh, of uh, the different groups in our society we know for example that many women uh, are are um, not able to uh, to uh, leave relationships because they are so dependent economically financially in their spouses in their partners and of course we need to do everything we can to ensure that women and girls are emancipated in all levels and that includes economic emancipation also um, if that would not that perspective will not be included then uh, the legislations, regardless of if it's in EU level or national level, will totally fail because it goes hand in hand. The uh, the uh, the uh, financial or economic emancipation, where the the right to um, to be a part of and access to the labour market uh, is as evident as for men uh, and uh, and and uh, guys are. So yes, my answer on that is also that it is very much important. Thank you very much. Um, another victory was also achieved in December when we reached a political agreement between institutions on the gender pay gap, um, uh, pay transparency directive. So pay secrecy has long been an enabler of the gulf in pay between men and women. But with the principle of equal pay for work of equal value soon to be enshrined in European law, Hopefully, we can begin to see that the existing 14% gap reduced. From my perspective, I, I'm, we are very happy to see the, the text give a central role to trade unions in securing the information needed to tackle this inequality and see the text as a landmark win. So, money talks. I have an open question for you. Uh, so, who would like to start? What value are we placing in this directive? Dina, please. Thank you. Um, the European Communist Lobby welcomes the recently adopted legislative proposal on pay transparency by the European Commission, which has been long overdue. Uh, while there are many positive measures in the proposal, including a definition of work of equal value, the European Women's Lobby regrets that mandatory reporting on the gender pay gap only concerns companies with 100 workers which excludes many sectors where women work, particularly in small and medium-sized enterprises. However, it has been a success of the European Parliament to move it from 200 workers to 100 workers in the negotiations. It is now crucial that member states transpose it into national legislation, but also to make EU citizens, especially women, aware for, of, for their right to pay transparency and equal pay for work of equal value. Thank you. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dina. Um, I, I would like to ask a question uh, for... Um, for you, Stacey, um, specifically for carers, is, is pay transparency enough or is staffing the number one uh, issue facing your members? Can this be beneficial in any way? Thank you. I would say that both aspects are essential. Um, the first one on pay transparency when it comes to the long-term care sector, well, I guess I don't have to tell you, I mean, it's only experts in the room, but I mean, the gender pay gap in Europe is 13% on average. When it comes to the long-term care sector, we reach 24% according to a recent report by WHO and the ILO. And this, despite, as I said before, uh, despite the fact that long-term care is a sector that's largely dominated by, by women. 
So clearly, paid transparency is extremely important in the sector because we need to uh, ensure uh, fairness. We need to encourage uh, retention, again, in the context of an aging uh, population. And we need to foster trust and attract uh, talent. But that's not going to be sufficient because uh, the working conditions in the care sector are also extremely difficult, uh, difficult working times, um, uh, low wages, a lot of part-timers and so on. And as a result, obviously, we see staff shortages. So we also need to boost employment in the sector by making um, care professions more attractive to all populations, including men. Um, so it's, we need to work on both fronts. Uh, and I think that applies to care, but that applies to all industries. Yeah, um, thank you, Stacey. Um, so the, the concept of uh, compensating workers for lost opportunities won't be uh, lost upon any of us. So how significant is this? Is, is this? And uh, do you have any experiences you'd like to share where the, this text will be beneficial? Um, I don't know if MEP in Sir is still with us, but I'll also open. Okay, so if MEP in Sir is still with us, sorry, I can't see the screen. Uh, but please, okay, can you, do you have the floor? Could you just, apologies, could you just repeat the question? Okay, so the question, uh, first of all, uh, generally, if you have something that you want to share with us on the Gender Pay Transparency Directive, um, we, ha we, we know that um, it was like a miracle that we uh, had this uh, directive in December, but also um, um, if, you, if you want to share any experience with us where this text is beneficial for you. Well, uh, the text is very beneficial in the sense of ensuring that uh, women uh, have, first of all, access to the labor market, but also access to a safe labor market and access to a, safe, a labor market that is on the same, um, um, uh, the, 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 with having the same rights as uh, men have um, and without being discriminated at, to, to ensuring that, that we earn as much as uh, uh, male colleagues with the same qual qualifications as we do. So it is important to ensure that uh, we all across the European Union um, uh, end this discrimination that exists within the labor market against women. Um, and it is, of course, ben beneficial in the sense of that uh, these, uh, these inequalities between uh, men and women in uh, the labor market fuels um, and uh, makes it even uh, makes uh, the gender-based violence even uh, worse, uh, the physical gender-based violence. But of course, even the discrimination on the labor market is a certain kind of uh, gender um, gender-based uh, violence uh, itself. I would say. So I think that uh, the the uh, the um, work on combating uh, gender-based violence needs to, of course, include the perspective of combating uh, the discrimination uh, against women uh, that exists. Uh, and this uh, um, uh, directive in uh, December was the, were, is a very important part of the struggle. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, as, as trade union, we are very happy uh, that we got this directive for, for three reasons. One of them is, uh, like, the information is crucial for us to, to reduce the gender pay gap. It's impossible if we don't have the information. We can't compare it with uh, other employers, other regions, uh, uh, other sectors. It's impossible also to, to reduce the pay gap. The second important thing that we had is the, that the role of the trade union is in this directive. We can uh, have a pay assessment and contribute to pay assessment and be able to support our colleagues and workers uh, in asking these information. And the third one, I would say, and this is one of the most important one, is the reversal of the burden of proof. It's not on the worker to, to ask uh, to, to prove this, but it's on the employer side. And this is something important that will uh, help us because otherwise it's so difficult for workers to uh, prove um, the, the, gen the pay gap. Um, but this, I mean, this year we have had uh, three directives and uh, um, also we had the Women on Board Directive uh, that was, I 
for like 10 years, uh, we didn't hear about this directive, and suddenly it was adopted, So, which is great. Um, so the pay transparency along with the women on board directive will surely help to elevate women to leadership roles in our organizations throughout Europe. So um, what do you think additional barriers are needed to be removed to enable this? And is the legislation really the only way to provide women with equal opportunities? Who wants the floor? Susanna, please. Yes. Uh, um, the gender gap uh, um, is uh, uh, mainly caused by the part of a salaries uh, that has a variable uh, charter. So, mm, bonus, uh, product, uh, uh, and others, uh, um, and the others, uh, uh, the other uh, sense uh, by the difficulties in balance work and private life for women, which obliges uh, women to work at a reduced time, to work part time, and often fragmented uh, work uh, rhythms. Making a, uh, an obligation for employer, employers uh, to represent earnings uh, in comparison between uh, men and women, and women, and in all its element, economic uh, and in the way in the work uh, is uh, uh, accomplished, means uh, making it possible to investigate deeply the less causes of the gender pay gap and uh, to take effective rebalancing action. The two, uh, the, um, yes, the two directives, uh, pay transpa transparency and uh, women on boards, are uh, certainly an important tool uh, for uh, uh, legal civilization, civilization so, that helps women's uh, leadership to stand out. In order to achieve a complete gender equality, however, a cultural intervention is required that begins in society and contrasts a vision of a society based on gender stereotypes that includes women in cages, starting with the family and the work. The fight against the gender stereotypes must start with the children at school. In addition to legislation, which is an essential tool to guarantee compliance with the principle of equality, parity, equal opportunity. It is essential to create in society a real grounded feeling of gender equality so that there are no longer any roles, any profession, any activities that women cannot carry out. Thank you, Susanna. Um, so, before you go, MEP and I still have one question for you. <laughs> uh, so, we have we have heard that okay, this this year we have had three very important directives. But what we want to hear from you now, if uh, what do you think we need um, to deliver soon on gender equality? Uh, where else do we need to act? Uh, if you have any projects in mind on the, on this. Uh, or anything at the European level that you want to share with us before leaving? Thank you very much. Um, um, well, right now there is a discussion uh, within the European Council and within the European Parliament, also in the Commission, so <laughs> all three bodies, um, on the ratification of Istanbul Convention, which I think it's uh, important to mention also. Uh, and it is a huge step that taken right now in the Corper. There has been a decision, as far as I understand, that they will go ahead uh, in one of the upcoming um, uh, council meetings and uh, and uh, try to ratify the Istanbul Convention with a qualified majority. That's an important step. However, one of the worries that I have also, I have uh, after getting to know that it's not the whole Istanbul Convention that uh, is on the table. It is those part of the convention that are um, as uh, EU competence, which means that huge part uh, of the Istanbul Convention will not be ratified by the by the uh, um, uh, Council if it uh, if uh, if uh, they do um, um, what is on the table right now. So I'm 
glad that there are positive steps, but at the same time, I'm worried that it's not the whole Istanbul Convention we are talking about. Um, uh, that also shows the importance of the struggle um, be of, for a gender equal European Union uh, being taken on a European level uh, and on a national level, that this needs to go hand in hand. So Istanbul Convention is also one of the important um, areas that I also wanted just to, to, uh, to highlight on. And I think we, we need to intensify our struggle um, of uh, the ratification because we have six member states within the European Union um, uh, refusing to ratify the convention at the same time as we had one more uh, member states as Poland who have uh, previously declared that they would uh, the government have declared that they would like to withdraw from the uh, Istanbul Convention uh, as soon as Turkey uh, withdrew, which is not an EU member state of course, but Poland is and it is worrying when uh, a country who has already previously ratified it declare the, their intentions to uh, withdraw it. And I just wanted to also once again say thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me to this discussion. And I apologize, I also need to go a bit, uh, a bit earlier. Uh, but this is really an important um, topic that we need to continue having and continue keeping alive until the day um, uh, the violence against the women and girls are eliminated uh, wherever it takes place. And that also includes, of course, the working places. I would like to thank you as well. Uh, very much for your valuable um, contribution to, uh, to our panel debate uh, and thank you for the whole work done on uh, combating violence uh, against uh, women and domestic violence uh, and indeed uh, the um, Istanbul Convention is like very very important um, so now we still have I think how much time we have uh, 20 minutes, no, 30 minutes uh, before the questions. I have some open questions for you, but if there's anyone who wants to raise, who has a question to the panelists, please do not hesitate. Otherwise, I can ask questions. <laughs> please. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. It's rather a remark. I was um, I was very interested to hear the first uh, panelist uh, speaking of internalized prejudice against uh, uh, women in positions of authority, against women in positions of management. This passes from universities. This passes from uh, high schools. This passes from primary schools. Susanna uh, was, uh, has mentioned it some minutes ago. From very, uh, from very innocent things like jokes that uh, that that men are, uh, um, let's say, telling each other after football. From uh, innocent, uh, uh, the, the word innocent uh, in 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 brackets. Uh, remarks about uh, women driving, etc. And I think that we should focus in a way, I mean, I know that I sound walkist uh, as I'm, I'm speaking now, and this is not my, uh, this is not at all my intention, but I really think that there should be more thought about how to tackle that in an intelligent way, how to stop this machismo that passes, um, that passes uh, unobserved uh, on an everyday basis without at the same time, uh, let's say, give the ultra-conservatives the possibility to speak of taking away humor, taking away the liberty of speech, taking away, taking away. There should be a reflection on how to stop um, laughing at the expense of women and creating stereotypes without at the same time being accused uh, of liberty side or of lack of humor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, I would, I, I would say that education is very, very important nowadays and maybe this is something that we should also invest on education of girls and boys even uh, very young. but. If you want to react, please. 
Thank you for pointing this out. It's not only women in humor, it's, on, uh, it's women in sports as well. It's women in media as well. And I couldn't have agreed with you more that we need to tackle the machismo, sexism, also the not so visible forms of all of them, the hidden, even institutional forms of discrimination and what keeps these discriminations alive. And I would like to, since I have the floor, thank you, um, to also mention that we need to change the narrative because if we keep on working how to tackle all this but without changing the narrative, then the progress is getting slower. And I would like to give you an example. We, we opened the newspaper and we read an article a woman was raped last night at the campus. What if the heading of the article was two men raped a woman last night at the campus? And if some people do not feel comfortable with this change of the narrative, then this is an indication that we still got a lot of work to do, not only on humor, but as I said before, in the media, in every aspect of our daily life. Thank you. Thank you very much, please. Okay. Ms. Barrero, can you hear us? Apparently not. It's not a question in the chat. It's someone who raised her hands. So, Elizabeth, you wanted to. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. If I may. Good afternoon, Elizabeth Barreiros from UGT Portugal and also member of the Eurocadus Presidium. I just wanted to, to comment further to the last, um, what, what, what has been said lastly about education. Because what we see uh, actually is that in practical terms, nonetheless all the measures taken, campaigns, uh, and so on, pay gap and women's precariousness and violence are growing everywhere. And uh, we only see some <laughs> few practical results in day-to-day -day business, at least in some countries. To be honest, I think that we are still a long way from facing the gender issue in a natural way. I mean that we still have a long way to achieve the, the desired results and I think that we have to start indeed with educating the young gener generation because it's not by chance that we still have unfortunately a very high rate of the young girls who find it natural to be abused by their boyfriend, boyfriends. So it's, it's indeed a, a question of changing mentalities and not just applying policies. Uh, of course, legal measures are vital, are important, but it's also vital, it's also important to change mentalities, and this begins with young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And yes, indeed, Elizabeth pointed out a, an important point also for us is that uh, um, how, how do you think we can be uh, more effectively uh, outline, how can we more effectively outline the work being done uh, to European citizens, many of whom are impatient for change, we can see that, uh, and how can we show that the European institutions are a vehicle for progress, how can we be more close to the citizens when it comes to these very important and very complicated uh, topics. Yeah, 
Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I'd like to answer some of the previous questions as well, if, if I may, or at least do my best to try and answer them. Um, on your last question, yes, education for sure. I think, quite frankly, EU institutions could be better when it comes to communication towards the citizen. National decision makers too often use uh, EU institutions as a scapegoat for everything that's going bad. You know, every time we have a new national election, we hear how Brussels, you know, imposed something new and, and usually bad on, on the country. So uh, we need to improve that. I think the role of civil society is also extremely important. Uh, so our umbrella organizations. And yet, more and more, we have to work with extremely limited resources. And, and so that's also some, something that should be more prominent in the current uh, discourse and narrative in terms of the future of Europe. If we want to preserve social cohesion, we also need to support civil society. Um, now, coming back to the point um, made earlier uh, about the root causes, I don't have Quite frankly, I completely agree with you. I don't have, I'm afraid, uh, a good answer to that. But I suppose the best we can do is to continue to highlight the, um, the way these um, inequalities are institutionalized somehow. So the instruments currently on the table focus on the labor market, on violence, on, on many very uh, important aspects. But uh, coming back to your question to, MEP, to the MEP, I think there are still you know, some aspects that haven't been addressed at EU level. Uh, for example, in our work recently, we were looking at the root causes, why uh, and, um, you know, there is still this stereotype according to which it belongs to families to take care of their own. And when I say families, obviously, I mean women, essentially. Um, and actually, when you look at um, you know, um, the way the labor market is structured and policies around the labor market, actually, the, the legislation tends to support these stereotypes. And um, one aspect that hasn't been explored at EU level, as far as I know at this stage, is fiscal policies and how fiscal policies also contribute to um, the second earner in a family, again, usually a woman, assuming caregiving responsibilities because it would be too expensive to access the labor market for the family or because fiscal policies tend to be, you know, to become barriers for employers to hire a second earner, you know, in a family. So we need to look into these structural barriers as well, I think, in the future. Thank you very much, Stacey. I don't know if there are other questions from online or from the floor here. No? No. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I would like to add something. Yes, please, Dina. Um, apart from the family issues, we also have the women in politics issue. Yes. And I would like to share with you, if I may, our uh, recommendations to ensure women's equal participation and equal opportunities, especially in the context of the coming elections next year. So, um, we uh, would like to recommend to establish mandatory parity in candidate lists for EU election lists to ensure female candidates are placed at electable places of EU election lists by making compulsory the use of quotas and methods to alternate female and male candidates such as zipped lists to spell out the obligation for political parties to nominate both a woman and a man as lead candidates on EU electoral lists, to take advantage of the Women on Boards Directive a review to include non-listed companies, extend the scope to small, medium enterprises, provide for binding sections and make void Article 12 suspension, to propose candidates as commissioners in a way that equal representation of women and men among members of the European Commission is ensured, to adopt binding legislation to reach equal representation of women and men at political decision-making positions, sorry, including quotas and zip systems depending on the electoral system, and to ensure active political participation of women's rights organizations and provides safe spaces to do so, in particular organizations representing women with disabilities and migrant women. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Dina. Um, I have a final question. So our, our panel uh, is based on one question, a year of transition or tangible change. So I would like to hear from you one by one what could be your concluding assessment on this. Let's start with you, Susanna. This time is a necessary uh, transition, but uh, uh, the, uh, the address of our uh, action uh, is neat. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, it's uh, possible to <coughs> uh, think a desire uh, gender-oriented. Uh, I would like uh, it if uh, information, media, social media, uh, or stop to represent the achievement of the top roles by women, include sport, when said Theo, as something abnormal or in any case exceptional. We, we women, are the fifth uh, percent, over the fifth percent of the human race. And this, no, uh, now, uh, our uh, uh, role is the, the same of the men. It's natural. This is natural. The other uh, situations are uh, natural, are uh, uh, illegal, so illegal. In the political, uh, we, Italian, have an uh, index uh, um, growth in uh, the past time, uh, six point, because uh, we uh, have a legislation with the quote, mi ricordo che si dice, le quote rosa cosiddette, quindi le quote gender equality and uh, uh, men and women that are not in uh, the list of a candidate in the uh, over uh, the, the third percent. So it's uh, have a, a great uh, growth, uh, the presence of women in, uh, uh, in political, uh, in parliament. Uh, also, as, um, uh, always, uh, we Italian uh, did uh, the law and uh, the control law. So <laughs> we candidate a lot of women, but elected uh, many, many <laughs> you, women. Okay, women. Thank you, Susanna. Stacey? Yeah, I'll be short and I can only repeat what I said before. Uh, definitely transition from our perspective. Um, but we have a lot of instruments on the table, very promising instruments between the, you know, the directives that were discussed today. I mentioned the, you know, the, the care strategy, the work-life balance directive, the gender equality strategy. There's no excuse anymore. I mean, we have everything on the table. We know enough to act. So it now belongs to member states to implement and, and make a difference. So, yeah, and that's what I, I would say. Thank you, Stacey. That's promising. Dina, please. Yeah, I would like to go a little bit further from what Stacey said and uh, make our public commitment that the European Women's Lobby will uh, keep on working with all its members, more than 2,000 uh, women's organizations on the ground, bringing their voice to Brussels bubble and make sure that everything is included so as to have this, um, uh, the instruments we have, and they are many, and may I say that they are many, we are very happy about them, but they also highlight that there is more that needs to be done. So uh, please accept our commitment to working hard. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dina. Um, yeah. 
Can I just begin by thanking you all, the panelists today. It was, um, uh, it was a very nice discussion that we had. Uh, I think that we have a small break now before we go to the second panel.